Okay, here's the deal with this anime. After I did my Genmo Senki later review, I wanted to check out more works from Kunihiko Yuyama. Seeing his filmography, he is responsible for a lot of anime from my childhood like Minky Momo, Sanshiro, Slayers, and one of the funniest anime ever made, Time Travel Tundikimon. I've seen that anime back in the early 90s so many times. So I decided to review an anime he made I didn't watch, and when Daria caught my attention, for one simple reason. It is from the same two people that made Leda, Kunihiku Yama directing, and Mitsumi Inomate being the art designer for the world and characters, who later becomes the leading artist for the Tales series. If you've seen my videos, you know I'm a huge Tales fan, especially for its art and character designs. When Daria is an adaptation of a novel written by Kisuke Fujikawa and came out in 1986, one year after the director's impressive anime Genmo Senki Leda. Therefore, I had this expectation that it will be on the same vein as that anime. So I hunted down the Laserdisc, complained about the cover because I hate it when they just put a screenshot instead of an actual cover art. You have Matsumi Unumata and you use this crap as the cover? What a waste of potential. Then the internet proved me wrong. There is another Laserdisc release with precisely the cover I wanted. So I'll pretend this mini rant never happened. Anyway. I watched it, I cried, and it far surpassed my expectations. It also received a DS game in 2008 adapting the anime, which is a 2D RPG. Something to consider is that I will not talk about the American version of the movie, where it received many changes like cutting down the runtime, editing the script, and changing the original ending. I'm not well informed with it, nor I'm familiar with American releases of anime. I will solely talk about the original Japanese version. The film opens up with a funeral and gives a first look at how this world works. The dead gets turned into red spirit like birds and they get sucked away into a flying ship that hosts all of these souls. Then we see the happy hard working couple Izu and Marun who was at the funeral. They are from the village of Blossoms, a farm village that worships the tree Wendaria. One day while they are selling the goods at the kingdom of Etha, someone from the Paro kingdom opens the sea gate causing a flood that spreads across the city and Izu rushes without hesitation to close it and succeeds. The issue is more significant than expected because the two kingdoms have a peace pact that lasted for centuries and Paro just broke it. Everything slowly descends into a deadly war as the princess of Ithanas and the prince of Paro Jill tries to stop it as they believe their love for each other will win by the end. At the same time, both nations see the benefits of having the neutral village of Blossoms on their side, so they get dragged into the war as well. This anime is an evolution of Leda in every way. All of my tiny negatives from that anime is fixed here. More exploration of the world, exposition on its lore and legends, and more characters. The similarities are there with the medieval fantasy mixed with sprinkles of technology like the red hover bike, ring gum from Leda shows up in the beginning as an easter egg. Small things like this show that the love for that anime is still present with the team. But oh, it goes far and beyond with tone and execution. This is not a happy anime like Leda. So if you're expecting something similar as I did, you will be surprised. It starts hopefully with naive people seeking love and bravery, then slowly sinks into the abyss of darkness that is war, and it goes deeper until there is nothing. Love turns to obligation and heroism turns into greed. The plot holds no punches with the depressing moments. It is flowing with the nihilism of war and that no human is immune to it. Sometimes love doesn't work the way you want it to be, and this anime tackled that. People want to live a happy life, that is the main goal, but that definition differs from a lot of people and coexisting is not an option for some. Some see it as merely as embracing love and harmony then work on the issues. Others see it as fulfilling ego and honor to achieve happiness. The lack of compromise and communication destroyed the kingdoms, especially one I won't spoil, and things could have been better if they just had a meeting. Separation opens the door to many horrible things, and it will not stop until understanding one another is reached. But sadly, sometimes even that won't stop a war. The setting is the first thing that fascinated me, a fantasy that felt like home because the lore building is low key and gets explored naturally as the story goes along. Ether is more on the nature side that doesn't use technology, so their people are wholesome with a sense of community that embraces the little things in life. 
On the other hand, Paro is full-on industrial and mechanical, and made its people lazy, dull, self-centered, and lifeless. Paro mirrors our modern life, and it makes sense that they started the war. Their unnatural life spreads like a plague and destroys what made everything beautiful in the first place. The two kingdoms with their opposite personality seep into the characters and reveal either their good-natured side or their animalistic greedy side. The young wanting to solve the problem without going into war while the old rulers only see war as a solution without any room for discussion. And sometimes their way wins, and the young follows into their footsteps. There isn't a leading protagonist in the story. At first I thought it was Izu, but as the plot progresses, I stopped thinking that because he is such a despicable character. And it hit me. There is no central character. It is the story of the two couples, Izu and Marin and Ahnes and Jill. They are both engulfed into this war and each gets affected differently, but their end is the same. It doesn't matter if you are part royalty or a farmer. War does not discriminate, it destroys everything. The best compliment I can give is that it's a Tales anime before the Tales series existed. The character designs are vibrant and memorable, it is signature early Unamata, and it is the perfect companion to use for a fantasy environment. You can't help but notice how world supervision is the top priority while making this anime. Scenes go on for a few minutes to display how picturesque the setting is. The enchanting creatures, especially Maran's pet, oh my god I want one. Even indoor moments are entrancing with a considerable amount of detail. Paro's design is all cyberpunk that gave me new Tokyo vibes from Akira. Not a single scene made me forget that this is a rich looking anime with fluid animation. Everything flows like a steady stream. The polish is magnificent. There is a reason however why the immersion is so imperative. It's not only for a technical display, it is vital to the plot. The animators want the viewers to fall in love with this marvelous world so when everything goes to shit with the war, it'll break your heart. That's what happened to me. The art honors the story and I love it when that happens. The second the title shows up, orchestral music hits my soul, and I got emotional. I'm not kidding. It was so graceful I almost teared up, and the anime didn't fully start yet. The soundtrack got stuck in my head for days. A remarkable orchestra and synthetic tracks that are stellar. But the music is only useful when used at the right time, and they achieved that here. Moments became more impactful, touching, and somber because of the choice of music used. I can fairly say that there is a scene that only became memorable because of the soundtrack. Well thought out music elevates what's on the screen and addresses our current emotions when watching, and it sure did with Wendaria. I ended up with multiple kinds of feelings when the end credits rolled, and they are all negative emotions. I felt disgusted and depressed about how things ended, and I love it. The dilemmas the characters endure during war is heartbreaking, as they ultimately determine if we are good or bad people. War is a tragedy, nothing glorious or honorable about it. It is despair, death, and eternal pain if you survive it. All that is left are ruins of cultures that were rich. The winner celebrates the war and lives on the blood of the nameless innocent people. One happy day can be the end of life as you know it, but beyond the politics, the hate, and destruction, what remains the same is the true owner of this world, nature, which is what the Mundaria tree represents. Like the natural world, it stays indifferent, timeless, never changing, and no matter how evil you are, it will always welcome you back.